So. It is. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hey, guys. Hey, folks. Hi. Hello, guys. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. We've got a few people still streaming in here. It looks like, uh, yeah, we've got a good amount of attendance today. Very excited about today's chat. It's one of my favorite topics. Uh, well, people coming in thick and fast. So it's just, it's just uh, give it another minute or two for people to walk, walk in. Um, but yeah, as we all know, uh, today's talk is about retention. Um, we're about halfway through the uh, running quality experiments portion of this program. Uh, so we're, we're doing pretty well. I think last week's, uh, last week's presentation of everyone's experiments, or at least one experiment that they're running, was a good uh, sign that we're, that we're on the right track. I really enjoyed some of the, some of the experiments on the, on the way there. Um, and uh, had a little catch up with the mentors as well on the same day. And uh, they're also feeling really positive about the way things are moving. So uh, I'm, yeah, just generally want to say thank you to everyone for, for making the effort to, to get this far in the program. Uh, now, for the most part, one thing I noticed about our experiments is that we're, we're really focused on the top of funnel stuff. We're doing a lot of acquisition and activation type stuff, which isn't bad. It's really great. I mean, I've always, always good to pull the top of the funnel early on in the days. But moving further down the funnel, I just wanted to maybe introduce some ideas about, about what we could do to retain our customers a little bit better. Um, and uh, there is no one better uh, position to help us out with that than Rahi Jain over here. And thank you very much for joining us, Rahi. Yeah, hi guys. So Great. Now, Rahi, like, is uh, it's just like the rest of us. He's a self-made entrepreneur, something of a serial entrepreneur, if I can say. And uh, he's learned uh, the retention lesson, a very hard retention lesson, and has, has doubled down in that regard because he understands how important it is for a startup's long-term success. Uh, certainly, like a lot of us get the acquisition recipe right, and it's really encouraging, and we see customers coming in. But uh, then maybe three, four years in, uh, we yeah, uh, we've really got to start focusing on retention, keeping all those people in there. And Ravi, of course, you learned that uh, you know all about that I about mean, that lesson. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so tell us a bit about your your e-commerce journey. Yeah. So it was uh, like uh, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. So it was not a problem focused kind of entrepreneur. Like I want to solve this problem. I just wanted to be an entrepreneur kind of a thing. So it was, I tried some ideas in college. Then there was some ideas in, uh, while I was working, then e-commerce was picking up in India. So I jumped into e-commerce. I had, uh, I worked at an e-commerce firm for one year, sort of to get an understanding of how things work. But uh, then I jumped in and I didn't know if I knew better then I would have prepared me better, but, uh, uh then it was all along the like it was a seven year journey we learned along the way i started as a dolgo but then i moved to the whole marketing side getting the customers in and all those things and eventually it scaled like it's just scaled to like 10 million usd yearly revenue gmv top line and uh, then it was like uh, the things were moving good but there was something un undercurrent and it was uh, you can say we were lucky in the sense of Facebook, right? We rode the Facebook wave from 2014, I guess. And uh, the, the click rate was um, very good for us. And then it went till like the party went till 2018, 19, sort of say. So, so then it uh, uh, got up, but uh, eventually the, my learning has been that uh, if we would have focused more on the retention part, less on the growth or uh, like a year on year, like doubling the numbers or 30, more than 30% or like a, uh, like a startup is like 2x, 3x kind of growth. So if we would have chased uh, growth from the right means, so then it would have been made. So. Great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, e-commerce is a great lesson. In 2014, that's like the days of Groupon heyday. That's yeah. like Facebook early days, right? Like a lot of success from those big growth mechanics. And I think if we look back at some of those stories, like I think Groupon is a great example of this. Like great acquisition channel, really yeah. killer for getting people in. But yeah. wow, did they not last for a very long time? I mean, they, they really struggled for, I think they struggle nowadays to survive because yeah. they just can't retain people's attention. But um, fab.com was there, like they raised around 150 million and then they fab.com. So it was in uh, 2014, 15. So they were pretty big in US and like they were uh, uh, from everyone, uh, but then it was a crash sort of a thing. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, I've put Rahi's uh, LinkedIn in the chat, so feel free to connect to them uh, and like, subscribe, uh, all those things that, that we ask, uh, ask uh, viewers to do. 
Um, and I'm going to stop hogging the airtime and let Roy uh, share some of these great insights. I had a little sneak peek at the deck that we that we have today, and it's so packed with examples and frameworks and metrics to look out for for retention. So there's so much in here. Um, I understand that some of you have maybe mastered some of these things, but there's definitely things in here that you that a lot of us have not mastered just yet. So it's worth tuning in for for the for the whole uh, for the whole thing. Um, oh, great. Abhishek Sarah as well. Awesome. Thank you very much for joining us. And I will be chatting to you on Thursday during our, our fireside chat on this topic. Looking forward to that. Um, but without further ado, Rahi, I'm going to give, I'm going to give you the stage and, and you can take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi guys. So, uh, uh, yeah, so we got the introduction part out, but, uh, yeah, so just sharing the screen. So, uh, yeah, so just to a disclaimer from that perspective that uh, most of the retention tactics over here are uh, from e-commerce perspective because I have spent like 10 years plus in e-commerce. So they are more e-commerce marketplace heavy, uh, which is more suited, I think, to the most of the startups, uh, uh, which I saw in the, uh, the list shared. But uh, uh, it's a little bit skewed toward e-commerce. So I try to share the framework also. So to get a better sense of like how to implement it into uh, your own uh, custom frameworks sort of a thing. So, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so we discussed this thing. So I started as a developer, then I moved to the uh, startup phase and I was uh, responsible for the growth. So the my co-founder was responsible for the supply side of the business. I was responsible for the product marketing tech and like a uh, growth side of the, or the uh, demand side of the business. So then it worked, uh, uh, we ran it for seven years. It was totally bootstrapped uh, and uh, we were able to scale it to a decent uh, sort of from Indian perspective. It was uh, really kind of a, like a series A company we were heading uh, head on sort of a thing. And uh, then it went crashed and uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, then I worked as a group and then I'm running since 2020 uh, this uh, as a, because I figured that this is the main problem to attack for next 20 years or 30 years, uh, sort of a, like a, from my expertise perspective. So yeah, so from 2017, uh, perspective. So these were the numbers, like we were doing 10 million. It was like a team of around 90 people. Uh, we had like, because it was a marketplace. So we had around like 5k sellers on board and it was totally bootstrap. So we had some venture interest, but uh, we wanted to keep it bootstrap and those things. Uh, so we uh, uh, keep on because we were uh, able to move the uh, cash flow cycles. And there were some symptoms in 2017 itself, like uh, our NPS was low uh, and it's uh, bad for e-commerce, like uh, less than 35, it was around 30. And we worked on that, like it's, uh, it wasn't that we didn't work on that, but there was some sub underlying issues which uh, we uh, were not able to take care of. Main part was the retention rate and retention rate was less than 20%. Uh, and for e-commerce brand, if you are totally relying on uh, advertising and advertising for us was like out of 10 million, 1.5 million was uh, spent on Facebook and uh, Google alone. And then there was affiliate cost, then there was a SEO and organic cost and all those things. And they also added up, but I think the paid marketing was too heavy reliance. Like our, if I talk about my GA, so in the GA, it was more than 50% of revenue was coming from uh, Facebook or Google. So it was totally skewed in that direction. And we tried to build up other channels, but uh, 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 we were seeing some success, but we didn't attack the core issue of it. So uh, CAC LTV was also a mismal like 1.5 and it's, uh, it looks good in that sense that you still have like 50% profit margin, but if you add operation cost, uh, uh, fixed cost and all those things, so uh, uh, this is uh, uh, is very easy to get in red. So uh, that was one of the reason. And uh, uh, this is the main metric, which I think, and this is the one of the reason why I'm very excited to be here because startups, uh, uh, whenever you go to the investor or any uh, further rounds, so eventually everyone will be obsessed about this CAC to LTV ratio. So uh, in DAC, uh, in everywhere, uh, in the even some uh, venture funds have on the form itself, like what's your uh, LTV CAC for last six months or those things. So eventually uh, these metrics are, uh, uh, important from an investor perspective, but I'm saying from a uh, building a healthy business perspective that uh, so uh, this uh, tend to be 
squid and uh, eventually what happens that people think that uh, 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 currently my CAC and LTV is low so I can sustain and what is happening in that case in the pre I would say less than 1 million or less than 10 million kind of range that uh, you are attracting the right audience like uh, your core audience and which is your uh, uh, on the Facebook also if you saw uh, like a, uh, your core niche and when you are targeting those niche, the ROI will be positive. So most of the companies might be over here. Uh, I hope uh, might not be here and uh, definitely might not be there, but uh, most of you guys might be over here and it might look that it might make sense. There was an iOS update or those things, but still it can make it work. But uh, uh, in my experience, what happens that uh, as you grow, uh, then the CAG start to catch up and LTV most likely or with aggressive discounting sometimes i have seen with uh, more uh, aggressive uh, advertising the ltv has gone down for the brands and uh, 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 more of the brands are limited with the uh, in the terms of selection and other things so ltv tend to remain in that range itself like uh, hardly 10% uh, needle moves on the ltv but cac is totally dependent on the external factors and it keep on increasing as you scale so uh, that's the slide i would say in that sense that uh, uh, encapsulate the journey of ours also that uh, we were early that uh, in 2014 15 i would say i was here then 16 17 we were here and then 18 19 when the crash happened and when we had to shut it down so it was came from uh, till here so it's a journey on the terms of CAC but LTV was more or less same for us and uh, one more thing is uh, addiction to paid marketing so uh, I might be unfair to John like <laughs> over here but uh, uh, the, the, uh, the point is not addiction to paid marketing as such like uh, Paid marketing is good, like it can give you quick results, it's scalable in a start, uh, but eventually you need to figure out other mediums to promote and uh, many startups I've seen that they are very addicted to paid that uh, 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 I need to get 20% growth on the month on month basis so I will increase my budget 20% on month on month basis but it doesn't work like that and uh, there are multiple reasons one is the niche uh, runs out you runs out of your core audience to uh, filter out then there is always a level playing field in the terms of that uh, uh, the widgets the dynamic part and all those things uh, they are pretty much same so your ad and uh, ad forming competition might not be very in the dynamic part mostly in the dynamic part it's very replicable sort of it's very hard to distinguish between each brands apart from the logo and these things so uh, then there is the iOS and the upgrade impact also has been there for last six months or uh, one year but uh, what I have seen that uh, uh, recently I saw one G of one uh, founder and 85% of revenue was coming from Facebook and uh, uh, Google and that's a very unhealthy place to be in I would say and uh, uh, they wanted to increase their budget on paid marketing. So that's uh, ironical, but uh, uh, they wanted numbers to showcase. And uh, they thought that I can increase my budget. Budget is not a concern if you can make it ROI positive or something like that. But eventually it was not an issue of uh, uh, this uh, like uh, uh, the performance part might be the case i'm not an expert over there but what i meant was that at 85 percent uh, it's very high reliance on paid marketing and you can't get 20 percent month on month quarter on quarter growth uh, by uh, increasing budget on paid marketing and so that's the main idea i want to walk you through like uh, uh, take away from the main part that uh, uh, be aware of addiction to paid marketing so it's very addictive and it's very it scales very easily in that sense and uh, surprisingly if you don't go for paid so what's your left with uh, uh, then it comes down to organic part and organic tend to have a ceiling like for early growth startups it tend to one part is the year on year growth so year on year growth you might not be happy with sort of like even if you rank for all your uh, good keywords and it might take two years or three years to get there but eventually it will also have a cap for high converting keywords and uh, uh, this is a screenshot from our company that at the peak we were getting this much kind of a like 12 percent of revenue and like uh, 12 percent of traffic and like we were getting like 300k visits from face uh, 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 social organic itself but eventually it was uh, we ran out of keywords uh, like uh, all the keywords were ranking in top five top three and uh, uh, other keywords when we are trying to get more traffic from other keywords they were not uh, uh, generating or converting so uh, it was more like a high up the funnel keywords or those 
funnels keywords so eventually i would say that organic in that sense in a typical organic sense like there is a scope of ugc and there is a scope of user generated content and all those uh, other meat models like medium has there or wikipedia has there so those models can scale in that sense like uh, user generated content and then uh, they those users get the traffic but for a e-commerce or from a marketplace or for a b2b brands uh, organic traffic also has a ceiling and uh, the sad part is the growth part that most of the founders will not be happy with this kind of growth because uh, uh, search volume on google your keyword will increase like 10 to 20 percent maximum in a yearly basis other unless it's a trend or like a very hot topic or some viral has gone but mostly for all the keywords is typically 10 to 20 percent kind of year on the year revenue so uh, uh, this is there so uh, there is a hope in cac also so cac uh, uh, in the whole equation of cac versus ldv so there is a hope of product led marketing which uh, i have not uh, went deeply uh, but uh, there are multiple three four points i wanted to discuss about like uh, if you want to fix it on uh, uh, without working on ldv and we are just working on the reducing the cac so there this three four models i have seen work and they are very big success like dropbox referral program is a big big success and there's a very good case study from the founder itself that they tried paid marketing for starting one month uh, starting one year they had their keywords landing pages all those things made but eventually they stopped that and they went uh, fully on the referral program uh, second was airbnb has a craigslist uh, hack it's a famous hack that uh, for every listing they used to ask uh, if they can post on uh, craigslist and they used to use a uh, simple html form to post it and uh, it was uh, done without the knowledge of craigslist it was not an api based thing and uh, that was a viral loop that you can uh, stand on the shoulder of giants and get some traffic or something but most of the things like uh, there were many successes in those sense uh, uh, who has got good instant hit from uh, facebook or like uh, if the app store has gone like but eventually the traffic uh, goes down because the market or the social media platforms uh, tighten the loop or even the craigslist uh, find out that this was the loophole in there and they fixed it then there was these two models are from china uh, and these are very famous ones in that sense that they are seeing uh, very good success in e-commerce and like a, a marketplace models so one is like a user generated content so they play around on review so it's more like a instagram plus uh, amazon combined sort of a thing you can say and there is a lot of user generated content and that's drive the seo traffic uh, back to the platform and then the users uh, buy again so that's a a uh, good model to look at and second the favorite of the uh, my favorite is ping duo duo so this is a recent one and they have a group buying feature so group buying feature is basically very much into like if i want to order groceries so i need to find some friend or make a team and then i can get a invite so they have a very inbuilt uh, uh, virality into the product itself and that's very tough to replicate also and it's very i would say lies uh, you guys are running experiments so you can run a small experiments around this but uh, uh, this definitely worth the try if something can be cracked on reducing cac from here so these are the models uh, which can help you with the cac part but uh, focus of uh, uh, this part is more on the ltv part the increasing what we do about the ltv part so uh, this is a jay abram uh, famous quote about the uh, there are only three ways to uh, uh increase a uh, grow a business and it's uh, uh, from uh, uh, from b2b to uh, saas to uh, b2c every model even from the agency our agency perspective also so either you can increase the number of clients uh, either increase the transaction value or you can get uh, people buying more from you and eventually first and two are overused sort of and they don't move the needle that much uh they move uh, i would say that uh, it's a, uh, a low hanging fruit and you can definitely fix those uh, but eventually uh, after two years down the journey or eventually if the cac is catching up your ltv or the growth is so good that the cac is catching up the ltv then it need to be worked on the third aspect which is the getting more customer to buy from you 
and uh, this is the simple formula sort of a thing like a simpler representation of the same uh, concept that uh, customers is visitors so visitor you can get from hack or like uh, uh, the viral loops and all those things we discussed or uh, it will definitely work on the conversion so uh, <laughs> i worked heavily on conversion rate optimization because i thought that these two things in my startup like uh, in 2016 17 i worked heavily on conversion rate optimization we hired a very big agency in us also uh, uh, we worked heavily closely and we then close to like a uh, hundred AB test uh, to improve the conversion because the whole funnel was a booking.com kind of a model that uh, you get paid traffic, you get AB testing, right? And everything is good to go. And we worked heavily on that, but uh, the growth was limited in that sense that we were able to optimize and increase our conversion rate, but that was not enough sort of thing. So I would say to focus on more on here, like customer lifetime value and uh, coming to the impact on revenue so impact is like average order value replaced purchase rate and uh, uh, this is one of the illustration like uh, how uh, it can impact uh, the revenue part uh, uh, the working on retention so this is a famous uh, heavily quoted kind of a uh, every blog you will find this quote like uh, working on retention increase like five percent increase but it was a cold case study but it was done by Bain and it was Frederick I think uh, he was uh, the main who invented the NPS score uh, that guy did this kind of study and uh, they figured out a uh, few things and this was led to but this was the more uh, 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 like a very heavily used, but I have seen like a 10% to 20% uh, kind of uplift uh, if I get a 5% kind of improvement in retention, which is, uh, and it also depends on where the things stand at the current, like if the retention is 30%. So if I can get to 30 to 35% kind of retention, then I can uh, get a profit ROI of like a 15, 20% kind of range. Uh, but this was the illustration about that. Like if you have a hundred customers and from uh, this hundred K audience and every customer is giving hundred dollars. So uh, this revenue is generated. And if we, if we get like 20% uh, unhappy customer and increase this LTV to uh, 110 uh, for these 20% of people and we keep 80% unhappy, then the impact on revenue becomes multifold uh, in that sense. Like uh, even if in this case, if you see like 10% of increment in uh, uh, retention rate uh, led to like a close to 20% kind of a uh, 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 20 to no, 15 percent kind of a increment in the revenue so that's the impact uh, which retention can have but it also depends on how much percentage these overall customers are there so that was the point i was making so coming to the uh, main part like yeah so benefit so benefits are so they are mainly from the study part i wanted to uh yeah so we will just skip through so they are easier to sell again they spend more with each purchase that's a uh, interesting insight that in which each purchase so the first purchase might be for hundred dollar the second purchase might become for the same customer 120 dollar and eventually uh they keep on increasing their uh ticket size like a 27 foot uh, like with every card uh, you will get uh, more out of that customer and uh, uh, they might uh, uh, have you like a uh, shop again and again and low cost to serve. So that's a very important part. And in uh, uh, marketplaces, operation costs tend to take away the profit. And if you have bad customers, so eventually the operation cost will keep on rising. Like you might need more customer support people. You might need more uh, Ticketing and more operation overheads uh, will be there. So uh, it's also beneficial from it's an intangible kind of a thing, you can say. Uh, so intangible is also employee satisfaction, which is very much neglected, but it's a positive part of working on retention that uh, uh, there is a impact on the employee uh, satisfaction. The second part, which is I think is good for early stage startup, is like you can try out new products. So even uh, if you have a 1% loyal customer. So if you have a new product launch or if you have a beta program or if, in, if you are trying something new, so those customers can give you good feedback. You know that they are more loyal and they are, uh, their feedback is more relevant in that sense. They are not window shoppers or they are uh, actually uh, engaged with the brand. So eventually this, this benefit tend to be really good for the uh, startups to try out new things and those things and uh, there's are intangible benefits so this is the framework like sort of uh, where i wanted to uh, keep the like 50 percent of the part so it's a uh, retention framework in that sense is uh, 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 there are multiple parts to it so mainly it's about the mapping 
the analytics part and the orchestration. So orchestration includes all the tactics parts, like whatever the real change we are going to do, that's the uh, orchestration. So orchestration is a funny word to say about it, but it's a more like a, uh, it's a consulting term, but orchestration is more like uh, the uh, how you uh, personalize the experience, how you communicate with the user. So every touch point you touch the customer and at every touch point, whatever the changes you want customer to do, or you want uh, uh, yourself to uh, engage with that. So that's part of uh, orchestration. Uh, analytics is an important part in that sense, how you look at the retention data and how you uh, prioritize about what data to look at in ret retention. And then there is a mapping part. Mapping uh, journey, uh, customer journey tend to be not very, uh, because typically people see journey as a like a uh, uh, desire, attention, uh, those kind of frameworks. And it's basically need, uh, uh, demand, and then advocacy and all those things. But uh, uh, we have a different take on uh, the stages. So it's a more nuanced kind of a take around the stages part, you can say, or it's more on the psychological level where the retention need to work uh, for the user to uh, to get the strategy working or orchestration working. So starting with the analytics part. So analytics is basically like four bundles we uh, keep uh, for if we work on a new client or something. So there are four metrics we typically look at uh, for, from a retention. So one is the KPI, the repeat purchase rate, uh, churn rate, or those things, uh, uh, like uh, what's the NPS score and uh, number. Uh, the more important part is cohort. So cohort tend to be very uh, uh, truthful in that sense, like re retention rate might show a different picture, but cohort tend to give a very real and in a short terms of spend. Like if you are working on retention and you want to see like a uh, month on month improvement or month on month changes, then cohort is the way to go forward it. Uh, and maybe the key KPIs might not tell you that soon uh, for that uh, improvement, uh, which have happened two months or three months kind of frame, but the cohort tend to give you a better stickiness and these metrics. Segmentation is very important in the terms of orchestration that what orchestration is strategy or whatever the strategy is that which is going to win audience. So that's a confusing for some people like uh, in the terms of cohort and uh, funnels. So funnels is not, we don't uh, view funnel as a very integral part. Uh, funnel might be helpful for the journey part, but uh, we uh, prefer mostly around the segmentation because segmentation tells uh, about the the frequency also, the uh, recency also, and other things also. The, uh, funnel is more like a collective view of those things. So funnel I kept out, uh, apart from that, I think uh, in product management, every metric is there, but uh, uh, more or less uh, it's the cohort part and the segmentation are more important uh, in the early part. Uh, and once you have the RFM done, then the qualitative research and customer interviews, because you can't, uh, uh, the insights from bad in, bad customers, uh, not bad customers, but not loyal customers will not be uh, relevant. So I would say to keep it more on the uh, once done with the RFM part, then we move to the uh, customer interviews and jobs to be done interviews uh, something. But you need to find out what's the best customer is uh, before jumping into the qualitative research because sometimes it might not lead the real insight. So these two I would say to start with and then these are six months or north star kind of a thing one year uh, kind of metrics and uh, this is a part uh, like a intermittent uh, activity uh, done once a quarter or once a six months or something like that. So uh, coming to KPI, so KPI is pretty much straightforward. So I will skip this part like I think uh, you guys have, but uh, retention rate, churn rate and uh, average frequency. The cohort, cohort is basically like a, uh, uh, um, I read somewhere that uh, uh, this was on the mentor list that someone needed uh, help with the uh, KPI part. So uh, on the analysis for the product management. So from that perspective, the cohort is basically uh, around, uh, if you look at like a month on month uh, retention rate uh, in that customer. So in this data set, which I pulled, so uh, from 28K, uh, order or revenue, uh, we went to like a 34 point K uh, order. So eventually you can say like there is a 75% uh, repeat purchase rate happening over here in that duration. And the retention rate over the uh, three months window is around like a nine, eight of like a 25% uh, maximum kind of a range. And uh, if we see at the, what's the impact uh, when I meant like uh, for a short term analysis or like a, a month on month analysis cohort helpful in that sense 
if you have put up a new strategy, you want to see results now, so you can change the strategy or something. So cohort can tell you like uh, for these two months, nothing moved in that sense but if you look at this month so there was a positive impact even if the uh, this is a different data set like data set is different so this is not the same graph but uh, uh, what the main objective was that uh, if you look at the retention rate so there is an impact over there eventually the overall numbers are not moving as such like 91k 91k uh, in that sense there is also spike over here and uh, uh, two more things on the cohort so uh, one is the cohort is very good for seasonal uh, frequency so if you feel like that black friday or like a quarter four or those things uh, tend to spike so you would see repeat purchase in those months so uh, you might need to discount those that october will be good or like uh, december will be good for across all the cohorts and uh, uh, number i guess so number will be good for all the cohorts and uh, uh, january might be bad for all the cohorts so there might be a seasonality impact into it and second uh, apart from seasonality is like what's the frequency of user coming back so there might be a frequency like nine percent to six percent then there might be a jump like five percent jump is there so eventually there is some increment after six months which is happening so it need to be made differently but these are the two main insights which comes from cohort apart from this month on month analysis there is what is the seasonality impact and second is like is there any spike in the terms of like our product is used every six months or every three months there is a spike in need or those kind of things so those are two additional ways to look at cohort so the favorite part <laughs> or the main uh, focus is uh, segmentation so segmentation rfm tend to work really well for uh, this uh, for uh, other brands like for lead gen or for uh, some different uh, business models this can be the monetary value can be changed to that uh, recency and frequency will uh, remain with that key event. I would not say to create for a smaller event like add to cart or something like that. I would say create only one RFM for the main uh, event of the business or the main uh, goal of the business and uh, monetary can be adjusted. Like if it's a lead, so there can be a fixed value around it. If it's a uh, apart from other things, so there can be a difference. But uh, these two things pretty much remain the same, even if it's a uh, social media kind of app or something like that. So uh, uh, they don't use RFM, but uh, eventually uh, these metrics uh, are totally mapped on the event basis. So uh, this is a value which is directly correlated or something. So uh, um, yeah. Uh, so basically, how we look at the RFM part. So this is important as an analytics part or also in the terms of a strategic part. Like once you slice and dice your audience then uh, any strategy can come into the picture like uh, you can't be running loyalty program for all users or you can't be expecting subscription for using by used by all users or even for the uh, other strategy like cross selling or like win back or if the customer have uh, stopped purchasing from you or those things so eventually uh, for us like the sort of a retention part so everything starts with rfm like we do first the rfm part and then everything follows through uh, and once we have the bifurcation of user that where the user stands uh, in that sense uh, uh, then it becomes uh, easier that uh, the brand might not have much soulmates or soulmates is uh, so uh, uh, i'm just uh, i've not uh, gone deeper into as a rfm part but it's basically i will just uh, it's a scoring method on the basis uh, on the score of one to three or one to five we typically give a score if the order is recent then we give a score of five uh, if it's a uh, three months old then we give a score of three or if it's a one month uh, like a six months or like last order was one year ago so then we give a score of uh, one and uh, uh, frequency is similarly like if the uh, how uh, often like a 2x buyer or 3x buyer or 4x buyer like a repeat buyer with uh, a lifetime value of a typical point or like they have purchased multiple times like six time buyer or five time buyer then they go into the higher frequency so uh, the higher frequency user might have recently bought a seventh time so that will go into the highest kind of a soulmate kind of a slab and the as a similar scoring is given to uh for monetary as well like the amount on the ticket size and from the score of one two three or one to five or one to three you make a grid of like three into three into three or five into five into five so it's a like 125 segments are there or like 27 segments are there and from those 27 segments like if i keep it simple like three uh, grids so then we put a bundle on those like a five 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 
score will be soulmates or breakup will be one 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 and potential lover will be uh, who have uh, recently not uh, recently bought but they have shown interest uh, like uh, they have placed more more orders than flirting and uh, so there is a breakup of those audiences so uh, uh, I have not gone deeper into this but uh, this is really helpful to break up your audience into six or eight actionable segments because segments can go and that's the biggest issue with the personalization and segmentation part that people overdo it it's uh, if uh, and the challenge is the execution part that if i make 50 segments i might not have a 50 marketing strategies to target 50 segments so eventually i need five or six segments to uh, uh, put up my marketing because otherwise the messaging will be same for all 50 so there's no point making 50 segments and giving the same messaging and if i break it further and if i get like 10 people into the segment and i'm putting a campaign for them or like a strategy for them it's not worth the roi so eventually it comes down to like five to six or i would say like 10 we rarely use like these 10 we also use like five to six is good enough for us because um, uh, brand typically tend to run out of the strategy than the segmentation part. So that's the point I wanted to convey. Uh, uh, apart from that, yeah, so the stages part. So stages, I wanted a different slide, but this was the best we can do. But uh, uh, these are the stages like in that sense of uh, apart from the need and those things, uh, eventually the customer goes through these stages. and. Uh, uh, it comes down to like uh, uh, assessment is a typical uh, need, desire and attention, those kind of stages. Uh, the main, main work is start with the activation. So activation, we count activation as when the customer has bought the product. So bought the product is not the closer of the retention journey. It's more like a starting point of the retention part. Uh, and from there, it taken that what experience we are able to build for that customer and those stages tend to play a big role that uh, where the activation will take place so activation starts with like onboarding or those things uh, like a welcome series for e-commerce so those things are basically if someone has signed up or someone has purchased uh, then uh, they have committed to you like they have given uh, their faith in uh, they put up their faith in uh, the brand and they wanted to try this out but uh, uh, there the brand or marketing or the product team tend to ball, uh, drop the ball that the main goal is the getting the sign up or getting the purchase but from a customer perspective it's mostly like a trial like even if i purchase uh, first order from a, some new website in e-commerce e also uh, then also it's a trial because instead of uh, uh, before referring before becoming loyal and all those things i'm just trying the first order or i'm taking a trial or i've just signed up on the website to see how the website looks or if i'm making a deal or if i'm putting my car like i think uh, from the car uh, i'm putting a uh, car so i'm just uh, signing up for the seeing the how the process looks like how the website looks like how the so it's a first stage of activation it's not the uh, closer at the sign up has happened so everything is uh, so the retention starts from activation then we go for affirmation so affirmation is a buyer's remorse like uh, every customer tend to have a window of buyer's remorse like even if you sign up or you take a trial you leave it after uh, one hour of uh, playing around so there's a buyer's remorse and even if you after shopping after placing order you feel like adrenaline rush and then there is a buyer's remorse which comes into and it's a psychological phenomena so uh, basically that stage like two three days or if someone has just started a trial so next two three days they will uh, need like a confirmation that uh, this is what i was looking for or this is the really thing which i needed so uh, even if you get an impulse buying, uh, then also the compulse, uh, the affirmation is more like a affirming the decision that I made the right decision. And sometimes buying is a very social, like uh, you need to tell your wife about it. You need to maybe from employee, uh, there's an employee involved. There's a team which eventually be going to work on that tool or you bought this product for something or even for a card like a showcase or um, there's a public uh, social element to it so you want affirmation that i made the right deal i was not uh, taken for granted or i was not uh, uh, taken for the right so affirmation is a big important part uh, which need to be worked and it can be worked from the marketing part and the product part assimilation is when they are uh, learning the tool they are fine with the tool accumulation is basically when they really see the value of the tool like i bought this product so eventually for a cosmetic it might be like after 15 days of delivery 
they are seeing some improvement or they are seeing some benefit of it uh, for a product or for an apparel it might be like a i have finally used it in a public or like i have uh, went out with this dress and i got compliments so that's the uh, when they really see the value so the value is not uh, sometimes uh, brands ask for review just after the delivery so eventually you need to give this time to see you uh, let user to see the value of it otherwise um, he might not be able to write judge and uh, even for the erp or like a b2b kind of a setup it might be like a six months or three months kind of erp setup and then they might able to see the value of the product but eventually when the initial payment or initial transaction activation happened or when they uh, book the trial when they see the value that's the real uh, impact where the retention start taking place and then the uh, sorry admission and this and uh, assimilation so, uh, and uh, assimilation so they are comfortable uh, with the product so i was talking about mainly the seeing the value part of it like they have started using and then they are seeing the value of it so value part is very important in the terms of uh, value realization we call it in the terms of strategy that we need to uh, make customers see the value so sometimes customer might not see the value up front so it's the goal of the brand to make the uh, to get the value seen by the customer, maybe through dashboards, maybe through uh, reckoning. So I will uh, just showcase that. And assimilation is they are comfortable, they are part of the community, they are part of this. Adoption is basically when they start becoming like a uh, like a loyal kind of a user and they are actively using it, like uh, day in day out, maybe from a uh, subscription basis also, and they are uh, fully they are into the part of their lifestyle. So this is very tough to. Uh, like a mode can be created at this stage, like when they are fully adopted into the brand. So uh, loyalty program, subscription program, they need to target this kind of users who have adopted or they are willing from uh, assimilation to adoption kind of the range. And advocacy is once the customer is happy with himself, then only he will put his reputation behind it and then put it forward. Otherwise, uh, people ask for referrals very early into the uh, model and referral is typically not the top of the funnel. It's more like a, a very, if the customer is not satisfied, he will not invite his friends or he will not put it up his reputation on it or he will not do it about it. So it's advocacy comes last into the picture and it's a best part about the retention part, but it's, uh, I would say not the, uh, first strategy to work on. It's basically you need to pass the user through all these stages and then it can come down to advocacy and where the gag reduction uh, can come into the picture. But advocacy uh, need to work with the strong retention. So if you have a weak retention and then you launch a loyalty program or a referral program or like a uh, giveaway contest, so they might not be that much involved in that, like in the terms of actively advocating the brand. So uh, yeah, uh, so this is the, how it eventually work out, like in the terms of uh, once you have this, so orchestration can be around the communication part. It can be life cycle, emails, SMS, on-site, loyalty, referral. Uh, it can be part of the product. It can be part of the this part. And I have left uh, three, four things, but it can be like a customer support can also be part of it. Delivery can also part of it. So it can be a complete uh, a journey. Orchestration doesn't need to be from a product or marketing perspective, but I kept it mostly through that. But, uh, and my background is also that. So I have more comfortable in that, but it's, cover the whole operation part, like from a operation team, customer support team and other department can also come into this. But uh, from this, this is a broad categorization of how the orchestration fit into each other. Uh, the optimization is also there. So, uh, uh, and this is like an automation framework. So this I kept it like, this is not, uh, this is uh, from an agency, our agency uh, do this kind of work, but uh, it's basically uh, uh, what I wanted to convey was that this is a, a journey about the potential customer. And these are the touch points, like a communication perspective. So this is mainly from a product communication perspective and what layer we can put on, on the communication part so it can be like in the starting part you need to welcome and these things then the abandon and first purchase review then replenishment repeat loyalty referral vip so this goes in that sequence and then it goes to like the churn churning customers like a reselection or reactivation or like a win back kind of a sequence so uh, this is a complete like a simplistic view of that but uh, the goal is that the journey eventually stages are the same eventually on the Post purchase, we will take care of the buyer's remorse. In the upselling, cross-selling, we might uh, look for 
those things and uh, replenishment review referral so uh, those things comes as a part of extension of that framework so i would say to focus on this framework more uh, while thinking about the ideas and seeing how the uh, strategy fits into each other apart from looking at this so this is a narrow view of that uh, this part so now coming to the tactic part so i'm running a little uh, behind but uh, yeah uh, so onboarding so onboarding is in the starting phase uh, it's the basically uh, applicable i wanted to do for the startup in the but i was not able to uh, get it done but it's basically like uh, uh, as we discussed like activation is very uh, the once the customer is uh, affirmation about sort of like uh, affirmation to activation activation to affirmation kind of stage so they are they want to uh, get involved but they want to make sure that they are uh, they signed up for the right thing they bought the right product or those things so this is basically like uh, on the website like finding the aha moment is there in the product management term so there's a finding the aha moment which is for facebook it's like uh, seven friends in 10 days kind of a thing or for twitter it's uh, like if i follow five people then i might stick to that so i'm seeing the value of the product in e-commerce it might be like uh, if i uh, sign up and then i start with the add to cart or like i'm going on the about us or like a contact us uh, those pages where the history part and the usp the benefit and uh, every startup has a very unique story so that's make us different from the old businesses or those things so there is a very strong why into it there is a very strong need into it the problem we are solving and those things so those things need to come out to the customer and they can be come out in the welcome series or those things and customer onboarding onboarding i kept it just from superhuman perspective so superhuman uh, does those things like uh, uh, these are examples sort of like uh, this was the sequence from like how the the journey looks like maybe from a brand story because i come from that marketing automation so that's why i kept it it's not but it's a more like a sequence kind of thing like how i walk user through every step of the brand and i want to convey the story part also i will convey the authority part i will contain the content part i might uh, pile on on the coupon part because i eventually the revenue need to be there but still uh, the story part and these parts are important like uh, uh, there can be onboarding which is very typical for the saas brands and super women i wanted because uh, uh, they do manual onboarding so eventually if your ltv allows that you can do manual onboarding also so uh, that's one of so value realization sequence so value realization sequence is mostly around the assimilation phase which is more around the product marketing saas fintech kind of a where uh, we need to see uh, get the customer to see the value so it might not uh, with the product purchase because product purchase the value realization might be uh, uh, off site kind of a thing like it might not be on the website so you can't control the value realization like complement or like impact on the uh, cosmetics or those things but eventually the goal is to run some value relation so there can be guides uh, how to guides help customer to succeed uh, things from customer because he has already paid 100 dollar or like a uh, taken a product so what we can do to make it like a uh, get the most out of that 100 dollar like uh, for that purchase so uh, from that perspective there is a how to guides a product update new feature and important use cases so sometimes uh, 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 not from e-commerce perspective but sometimes uh, use cases for if someone else is seeing this kind of benefit so other customers should also see those kind of benefits so uh, in that sense like grammarly i use so grammarly sends me like this uh, uh, kind of so it's a value realization that uh, i am using for 1814 uh, 104 weeks and this is the word check and this is the alerts and all those things so this is a value realization sequence where um, they are telling me again and again that you use it and uh, this is the metrics for the week or those things and this is for a saas brand like a uh, ad tech brand so this is the company i used to work and uh, they used to have that kind of a like a dashboard for kid growth and all those things fintech can have a like improvement on the product there can be like a how many revenue run or how many benefits or uh, so any dashboard uh, where user can see their journey sort of like i started i joined this brand when i was here and then i have came to this point so what the journey i have taken sort of like a growth kind of a thing and then there is a, this thing so this is uh, only operational and uh, customer support because customer support plays an important role in customer retention but uh, uh, this i feel and startups tend to have a more issues around this in the sense that operation communication is not very clear and it's not very the policies are still in uh, uh, building mode and those things and uh, it can be worked upon like uh, in that sense uh, 
uh, you can provide more personalized service to the customer in the early days. But eventually, I would say uh, for good retention, crystal clear communication operational uh, is uh, more important. Like uh, if 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 uh, if someone has bought something, or even if uh, someone has. Uh, uh, taken up a trial or like uh, uh, any uh, like a car uh, reselling product or like a grocery like a uh, product so they want to see every step and they are involved in this because they want something is pending at your end like uh, from an operation perspective like food need to be delivered or order need to be so everything need to be showcased and I am big uh, there's nothing too much and customer want to see it. we as a customer also we want to see our money uh, working like we want to see the value for money and uh, if I spend something so I want to see it working kind of a thing so it's a very uh, important to give a very transparent view. the best example is like Pizza Hut uh, they tell you everything about that the order is placed there's a preparation stage then there's a baking stage and these so they doesn't need to tell you because it's a half an hour kind of order and they have patented it they have used it heavily and FedEx is definitely there but Operational, I would say around return policy, refund policy, even other policies also, uh, startups tend to have a mushy ground or like an unclear kind of a, because they are still evolving as a company. But I would say that give as much clarity as customer as possible. It might be like you are mailing um, every day about the order update or every day about the status update, what's coming, what's uh, next, uh, what's the next step? Like if you order something, so what's the next step? What's the, after this, what will happen? After this, what will happen? So that creates a lot of confidence in the terms of that. Uh, if I order again from this brand, so everything will be tracked and I am getting a constant clear picture. And this works uh, great for brand. This is very uh, intangible kind of a thing, but still. So this is like a RFM. So once you have that uh, uh, loyal customer base, uh, in that sense, uh, uh, like one percent of audience, and then the goal becomes that uh, most of the brands tend to ignore those users. Like uh, they don't uh, take care of them, especially. And people know that I have ordered five times from this website, but uh, the experience is the same, and the use uh, the user is the same, treated the same, or uh, there's no appreciation. It's not about the discount part, but it's also about that. Uh, simply a badge can work like you are our top customer. Even the simple sticker can work like uh, 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 we see you, we are here for you, those kind of things, I would say. And uh, this is like a, a going too far. I would not, uh, if it's possible and if you are into it, like uh, if you can do it, like uh, into is not the part, but uh, if you can do, and we used to do this, uh, like not appreciation party, but we used to do like a city-based uh, uh, office uh, invite sort of like we used to invite 10 people 10 or like a survey for the customers and uh, if uh, like 20 customers uh, used to show up and then we have a pizza order and uh, cold drink and like a uh, two three hours like a interaction informal interaction kind of a thing and they were uh, like a, we did it very small scale but that was a personal experience that we still uh, did it uh, like on a city to city basis and it was a uh, very good feeling in the terms of feedback, in the terms of uh, metrics and all those things. Uh, um, this is like, uh, yeah, so addiction to paid marketing and like uh, emphasis to that, that use paid marketing to get more loyal users. So the more, uh, the goal is that uh, uh, segment your, uh, uh, this is very uh, rarely used strategy, but this is basically you take your segment of your best loyal users and you put them back into Google, uh, Facebook and create look like similar audiences and all those, and you take it more from uh, those. And eventually it's basically that uh, uh, you are cleaning the acquisition sort of a funnel. And you can also use uh, paid marketing to target the repeat buyers. So uh, this is a fallacy like uh, retargeting and uh, repeat uh, retargeting tend to be like seven day visitor or those kind of things. So those are not repeat buyers. I'm saying like repeat buyers, like after 30 days of purchase, there should be campaign just targeting those repeat buyer audiences or like after six months of purchase, uh, there should be a targeted campaign around those. So uh, really I've seen like 10% uh, to 20% budget is not given over there, but uh, spending uh, these kind of budget, like even 10% will work, uh, I would say for repeat buyers to get the repeat buyers. And it's easily me measurable and you can see direct impact. Um, one is resurrection. So resurrection tend to be like win back and those things. So we miss you, latest update, we win back sequence, uh, joining and paid marketing sequence to resurrection. So this is more like a 
uh, what can go into the resurrection part like uh, uh, what's new what's the discount what's the feedback so feedback can also work as a strategy that if someone uh, the, the i don't have this slide but uh, there is a uh, if uh, like why the most people leave you and uh, around 80 percent uh, customer feedback or there was a survey which uh, mentioned that brand doesn't care about us so uh, the most common like 80 percent of people who change brands or like uh, who are not uh, uh, look for different brands. So the main uh, majority of the feedback has been that uh, uh, brand doesn't care about it. So that comes the one percent. Seeing the one percent kind of a, uh, a strategy comes into picture. And second, even asking for feedback. Even uh, I would say that work on the feedback. But even if you don't work on the feedback, asking the feedback tend to make customer feel special. Like someone is there to listen to me. So if there is a grievance or like uh, there is some uh, unsatisfaction so he can communicate over there and he will get a, like instead of going to uh, app store or like uh, uh, going to public review he might be able to give you a good review and if you uh, give good feedback and if you work on it so uh, there's definitely and uh, it will be beneficial and uh, yeah so yeah personalized experience so personalized experience is still uh, similar to adoption range like uh, once they are actively on the website then what can be uh, personalization can run and it covers mostly on the website kind of a thing so it's basically like uh, uh, what kind of recommendations you can give for the uh, welcome back or like a, uh, there can be nudge also there can be uh, after if someone has visited after one month uh, so there can be a different nudge if someone has visited after three months so uh, there is a cookie challenge with that uh, the tools are solving that issue but uh, i would say there should be some strategy around that and i would say to go more on the communication side because you know for sure that 100 percent uh, three months wide you will be able to reach out but if you reach that scale that uh, you have those people also coming on the website then there can be some pop-ups and some uh, messaging even on the banners even on the uh, uh, on a deeper level of personalization can be done over here cool. and let's um, just uh in the interest of time right i mean these are some great great yeah. tips and, and great retention examples and i think like all of us can can take one of these and run an experiment on them originally like uh, already i think these are some excellent examples and and this deck's going to be available to everyone so you can get these examples later um don't worry too much but uh in the interest of, of keeping it swiss i uh, just wanted to and uh, quickly have UG post the link for the webinar feedback thing, if you, if you don't mind. Um, and if you guys can can jump into that. Um, and yeah, these tactics are always going to be available for you. I got a lot of notes out of that. I got two pages of, of notes straight out of your talk. And I'm super grateful, Rahi, for your talk. I think what you covered around journey mapping, analytics, and orchestration, I think that that's a fantastic model. And you gave some great examples about how exactly to execute that. And that's super valuable. Like uh, it's just it's just um, the wealth of insight you, you you've got to bring to the party here is, is just amazing and and thank you so much. And I really like the orchestration. That, <laughs> that's a McKinsey term, and then uh, it's very tough to replicate on the startup level. Like so, that's a uh, uh, thank you, thank you for uh, that part. Like orchestration is a very uh, uh, big in consulting kind of a customer yeah. experience. Yeah. And you know, I'm so grateful that that you you also showed how to read a read a retention cohort chart as well. I found like that thing can be very intimidating. A big table, lots of numbers going across the way, and the trick is to actually read it diagonally across the months, right? Like that that's the kind of thing that doesn't doesn't occur to anyone when they when they first look at a retention cohort. And and I think it's on that. I think it's very easy to to celebrate uh, like revenue growth month on month like oh we got 150,000 this month oh we got 160 we got 170 and those it's very easy to celebrate those kind of things but um, but i think that the that the real value is celebrating increase in in retention cohorts right like moving from 15% to 15.5% to 16% to 17 to 18% because that so, that means that you you're really sustainable and going somewhere right yeah 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 yeah, so retention is a little bit slow, like I would say. Uh, that's a, one of the reasons uh, it's a, across industry, across departments, uh, there are multiple teams involved. Uh, it's uh, like, uh, yeah, so these are the few, few factors where the retention tend to uh, go behind the scene, sort of like, uh, 
so yeah, so that was the intention behind it that uh, uh, paid is not good and uh, retention is important. So even yeah, uh, yeah. whatever is slow, it might be like uh, it might be like six months to move five percent, but eventually the payoff will be huge in that sense, like in the terms of impact of that five percent. Uh, yeah. So that's uh, my takeaway from that. So, yeah, so makes, makes a lot of sense. And I'm not offended as a paid media person. I'm not offended <laughs> by that at all. <laughs> I think that it's it's definitely worthwhile investing in, in keeping those customers. I mean, if you're going to pay for them up front, like you you got to you got to be able to keep them in one way or another. And I think you got some great examples there, particularly like the the journey mapping there and and, and your, your clear examples there about how to treat customers at at different times of that. Um, yeah. And of course, you need the analytics to make that happen, and you need good orchestration to deliver the right message at the right time. Um, so yeah, uh, with that, I just I want to close out. We're one minute over, and uh, it seems does like to keep it Swiss. Uh, so Rahi, once again, thank you so much for joining us. Much appreciated. Uh, we'll be following up with a with a fireside chat on retention on on Thursday. And Rahi, you're welcome to join us for that. But I know you're a busy guy, busy keeping keeping businesses sustainable. Uh, so thank you, thank you once again. Thank you, thank you for the opportunity. So, so nice. uh, really, thank, you. thank you. You're most welcome. Thank you, Rahi. Cool. Anything we should mention before we go, Yuji? No, I just want to thank you, everyone, for filling in my forms and feedback forms. Just like um, five seconds of appreciation on doing that. Thank you so, so much. Thanks, folks. Have a great week. Bye.